Phil Newman, everybody. Thanks very much, Sean. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that's not my car, because we'd be in trouble then otherwise, wouldn't we? Okay. So, um, a lot of you may not be aware of the, the term longevity in the context of this being a new industry that we're going to be talking about today. And there's quite a lot involved in, in longevity, both from a scientific perspective as well as from a, uh, a personal perspective. So I wanted to start off with a, with a picture of my, of my beautiful wife. So, so this is my, my wife, Sophie. And um, she thinks I'm nuts with the amount of supplements I take and the cold showers and all the things that I do to kind of hack my own longevity, which are things that we're all aware of perhaps in, uh, uh, in our industry, but perhaps some of you aren't so aware of. Uh, but the, the strange thing is, is that um, my wife is actually um, 18 years older than me. Now, she's not 18 years older than me um, from a chronological perspective, but from a uh, metabolic perspective. So she had the menopause um, just into her 40s, and uh, that affected her longevity. It affects, affects all women. And the thing is, is that she's kind of one of these people that is, let's call it like a, a receiver. So she's a receiver rather than a believer. And there are a lot of people in our industry now that are going from a, a belief system of longevity being something that is, is, is possible to the science actually demonstrating that it is now. And that longevity is one of these things which means that our, our age is plastic. So as, a, as an individual, as you can see here, my chronological years were just shy of 55 years, but actually chronologically I was 47 and a half years uh, Oh, me metabolically, 47 and a half years. I'm now 46, so in some respects, I'm winding the clock back in my own body, which is what we're going to be talking about uh, a lot today. So for a lot of you, that you won't know um, the terminology around some of this, so let's just talk a little bit about what, what is longevity. And effectively, all of the healthcare systems that exist around the world now, they're effectively sick care systems. And of course, what happens is as you go through your lifespan, perhaps you'll get diagnosed with a, a disease of aging, perhaps you'll get another one. And then what will happen is, of course, is you'll go into a period of morbidity. And we've all got friends and relatives around the world who uh, are in this morbid state ahead of them dying. And of course, what happens is as soon as you commit your first disease to, to your body, effectively what you've got is you then, you're in, your, your health span has ended. So the industry's really started to identify its vocabulary, which is a very important part of the, the communications mix when you're bringing a new market uh, to, to bear. So what happens along the bottom here, as you can see, is if we're in a position where we can extend health span, really, as you can see right behind me, to the point where you're more or less healthy all of your, all of your active life, you have a small period of uh, compressed morbidity before you die. And then, of course, there are other people that would consider that actually age itself uh, leads to um, technologies that mean that at the end of the day, uh, people won't actually die. There's a concept of called longevity escape velocity, which I, I won't talk about today. So th there are some basics around all of this. Um, diet, sleep, exercise, the amount of alcohol that you take. Uh, these are some readouts from me. You know, this is, this is a, a, a good day when um, I've had a really good sleep. Uh, I try to get eight hours sleep or time. And this is where you're kind of doing international travel and doing parties and so on. And of course, you can see that this is really talking about heart rate variability, which is one of the factors that comes into uh, diet, sleep, exercise, uh, and alcohol. But I wanted to just go back to kind of my origin story, which is back in 2018, when I was looking for a new industry to commit myself to. So very much like a lot of you will have done in terms of the psychedelics industry, you're now embedded in an industry which is, which is formed and growing. The same with longevity, but back in 2018, I wasn't aware of that. But I read this article here about a company called Juvenescence who just raised 50 million pounds. And they were talking about longevity and they basically expanded my mind to the point where I wanted to learn more about this, this new and exciting industry. And take it back to where it is now, there are, Brian Johnson's gonna be speaking at the conference. You can see that what you've got is people like Kim Kardashian, having full body MRI scans, which is obviously identifying if there are issues with her, with her body, uh, and Brian Johnson uh, of uh, Blueprint, who many of you will be aware of, who is now in the position where he's very, very much publicly biohacking his longevity and winding the clock back on all elements of, uh, of his body. So in terms of where we are with the, with the industry, it's a case of, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the Gartner hype curve, and really it's understanding about where is longevity now as an industry. 
And there's another theory, which, as you, as you can see, the chasm theory, which is talking about how companies and, and industries go to the point where they actually go over the chasm and, and succeed. And the two correlate with each other. And a lot of people ask me, because we, we run an industry analyst group, is, is where is longevity now? And longevity hasn't actually hit peak expectations yet. Uh, but there are some very exciting things happening in the industry, which I'm going to share with you today, which uh, will back that up. But of course, the thing is, is that longevity is quite a complex industry, as, as any industry is. There are many components to it, many moving parts. And really what I like to do is I like to separate them into uh, now industries and next industries. And effectively, what you've got on the next industry is the kind of biotech side. And on the now industry, you've got the service side of supplements and longevity clinics that are all starting to appear around the world. So what we do as, a, as, a, as an industry analyst group is we have segmented the industry into 25 different domains. I won't read them all out here, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an explainer as to how we categorize the longevity industry, because once you can start to, to categorize it and you can start to count it, you're then in a position where you can start to measure it, which is something that we're going to be doing, uh, and I'll be sharing some of that data with you today. There's going to be a QR code in a short while, so if you want my contact details and you want a copy of these slides, just, just message me and I'll, I'll send them over to you. So we have these 25 domains of longevity. Uh, the nearest you can see to, to many people in the psychedelics industry is uh, neuropharma. Um, of course, Alzheimer's is one of, those, one of those diseases which is categorized within the diseases of aging. And really, all of these have got their own different attributes. Some of them are much earlier stage than others. And what we like to do, as I say, is to split them into these two different groups. So you have longevity now, which is where people are putting money into businesses or growing those businesses, and those businesses are actually generating income and profits. And then you've got longevity next, which is the longer term activities that are going on, perhaps in, in drug discovery uh, and gene therapies. And, and likewise, I'll talk about in a, in a moment, uh, reprogramming, which is where you're actually winding the cells back to a, to a younger state. So um, looking at the way that you look at that as an, as an investor is trying to understand where each of those are. And this is, this is called technology readiness level. This is a NASA thing. So they did this when they were doing the, uh, the moon landings to identify when something was fully ready to go to market, which is, which is obviously uh, a level 10. And when you're looking at hardware devices or supplements or um, things that are more reg reg unregulated than things like biotech, which of course is highly regulated, correlating the two together is quite difficult. But we actually overlay both of those together to understand on a scale of 1 to 10 where a technology is in terms of its readiness. So we kind of demystify those. So in terms of the last five years of investing, you can see here on the chart there's everything all the way down here to education. Um, there'll be pet longevity down here. And at the far end there, you can see there's longevity development platforms, which is where you've got a lot of um, AI now coming into the space to help with, with drug discovery. And you can see there's quite a, quite a few plateaus there. But really what you've got is you've got the big money going into biotech, which of course is uh, these companies are demanding a lot of capital because they've got to do uh, a lot of expenditure in clinical trials and so on. But that's the shape of the industry at the moment. And I'll share with you how much that actually com com comes to in terms of its cumulative uh, value. But just talking about some of the longevity now uh, elements of the industry. So, so this is longevity supplements. Now you can see that there's a big spike in 2021. Um, that, that appears in a lot of our charts because 2021 was really the breakout year for a lot of investing before things happened around the world which changed the appetite for investors and the way they were looking at things. But you can see that actually there's a lot of money going into, into longevity supplements. And there's a very interesting chart here. This is, a, this is a publicly quoted longevity supplements company. And you can see here their, their revenue is pretty, pretty impressive you know, for, a, for a supplements business. But you can see their, their actual market capitalization, the value of that business is, correlates very closely to their actual turnover. So you can see that there's, there are still some questions in the marketplace about the, uh, the value of, of, a, of a supplements business. Then the uh, longevity clinics are an area that are growing very significantly now. Um, every, every conference I go to, there's always somebody talking about a new clinic that they're starting. And you can see that they're attracting a lot of capital. They're servicing clients that are now going to those clinics and, and paying proper dollars uh, for their services. And we did a, a little survey which uh, we had 50, 51 longevity practitioners or longevity clinics take this survey. And we're, we're going to be publishing this in December. And you can see uh, that there are the top, top two categories are 
private clinics that have got multiple practitioners. So these might be aesthetics clinics, or uh, they may be just regular healthcare clinics. And you've got individual practitioners. And there are a lot of individuals now that are practicing doctors that are now migrating themselves over to being longevity practitioners. But there's an absence of standardization within the industry at the moment. And um, that is something that's going to be coming, hopefully, this, this year with a, with a kickoff meeting next, next month at the Buck Institute to actually identify some gold standards for, for longevity clinics. And you can see here, within the survey, we asked a very standardized question, which was, you know, a clinic can only categorize itself as a longevity clinic if it helps clients manage their biological age, which is what I talked to you about earlier about my, my wife's biological age. And you can see that there's not a, not a huge amount of alignment even in the industry itself at the moment. So it gives you an idea that we're in the foothills now of a very exciting industry, but there is, as with all industries, there is, there is confusion and, then, and uh, there are going to be winners and losers, of course, as well. So these are the diseases of aging. So there are some big ones there, as you can imagine. Um, three, th well, over $3 trillion now being spent by the US economy on managing these diseases of aging. And of course, this is what I was referring to earlier in terms of the, the sick care model that, that all healthcare systems are, are focused on. And when you look at them there, I mean, everybody in this room will have uh, a friend or a relative, or maybe even themselves experience one of, these, one of these diseases of aging. And sometimes they can happen much earlier in people's lives than, than people would want. And you can see that, uh, particularly in terms of type 2 diabetes and obesity, that's, that is a disease of aging, and that's got some uh, uh, relativity to a point that I'm going to make later on in my, in my slides. So the way that we actually look at longevity is across these, these three domains. So the longevity determinants, this is, your, this is your DNA, this is what you're born with, this is between 50 and 30% of your, your personal longevity that is inherited that you can't do much about. Then there are these aging drivers, which are the um, metabolic systems that sit underneath the way our bodies operate, which drive towards those diseases of aging. And then, of course, you've got the aging diseases themselves. And you'll see here there's a lot of, a lot of very complex terminology at the bottom here, but these are aging drivers, and there's, some of you may be aware of a, of a system called the hallmarks of aging, and this is, really underwrites a lot of the longevity science that's out there in the marketplace at the moment. But when you look at the, the way the industry actually operates, obviously, if you're in a position where you've got your longevity determinants, that is going to be putting you into effectively aging older or some of the, some of the meta metabolic elements of your body working differently. So if you can prevent that from happening in the first place, then of course you're, you're extending your runway. Of course, if something goes wrong, then there's the concept of renewing that. And this is what I referenced earlier in relation to cellular reprogramming, which is this concept of being able to wind the age of a, of a cell back to uh, an earlier state, but so it still gets its cell identity. So this might be a heart cell or a knee cell or whatever it may be. And then, of course, there are the aging diseases again, which have then got some very interesting treatments about them. And this is the, this is the nearest that longevity gets to regular health care now as a, a, as a crossover. And then sitting along the bottom there, of course, is diagnostics. And you'll see with, with my wife's situation, as well as my own, as well as Brian Johnson and everybody else's, there's a big debate now about the diagnostics that are used to actually identify people's health and longevity, uh, and likewise the potential track, uh, trajectory they've got for their, for their own life and health span. So this is an example of a company called Cyclarity. So what they are is they are a very revolutionary way of removing uh, plaque from blood systems. And they basically would be in a position where they would be able to uh, remove the potential of, of heart attacks and, and stroke. So the current approach, of course, is that you have prescription medications. You would go to the doctor for, for an ECG or EEGG. Then potentially you'd have to have a pacemaker fitted. And then likewise, if you actually had to have some, some form of intervention, it would be stents or whatever it may be. Whereas across the bottom here, the, the longevity approach is, of course, you, have a, you, know, you look after yourself, you eat the Mediterranean diet, you're in a position where perhaps you're getting an indicator very early in your life, maybe in your 20s or 30s, that there may be an underlying aging driver in your body that you need to start thinking about. Likewise, you'd then be in a position where atherosclerosis, which is this accumulation of plaque in your body, could be treated. Perhaps on an annualized basis, you might go to, to see your physician once a year to have a, an IV drip. And then the point is, is that actually, if all of that goes wrong, then there's very new, exciting technologies to be able to, to replenish some of the heart muscles, uh, as, as well as obviously reprogramming some of those elements of the heart as well. So, so this is the difference between traditional healthcare and the way that longevity is now moving. And it's, it is quite complex. 
Uh, but if really what you've got is a position now where you've got the old, the old world meeting the new world. So the FDA is under pressure, and I don't believe it ever will, uh, to classify aging as a disease. Obviously, there are diseases of aging, which of course there are multiple classifications for, but effectively, I don't think we're going to need that. But this concept now of being able to target multiple aging drivers at a systemic level to be able to keep yourself younger is really the way things are going. And we, we, I did an interview with the Wall Street Journal uh, last week, and they were asking me about what was one of the breakthroughs that we've experienced in the longevity field at the moment. And I'm sure many of you are aware of uh, Azempic, which is uh, effectively a, a type 2 diabetes drug which helps people with their, with their obesity. Now, the interesting thing is, is that if you are overweight, that's not actually a disease condition, that's more of a, a lifestyle condition. And of course, the fact that you're old is, is again, it's a lifestyle condition, not a, not a choice that, uh, that you're making through having an aging disease. So really, we see this as being a major milestone in the way that people are starting now to rethink about the way that uh, drugs that are available within healthcare systems are, are brought to populations. And as you can hear, I'm a, I'm a Brit in the UK. This is now being uh, prescribed for millions of UK citizens. So our healthcare system is paying for millions of people to have the skinny jab to be able to manage their, their, their weight gain so they don't have all of those downstream issues going forwards. And this is very exciting for us. And you can see that there are, there are other examples of that as well. And when you start to think about the concepts of where this is going to go for the industry. Here are some scraped headlines from, uh, from the FT about uh, Azempic or Novo Nordisk, which is the company behind that. You can see that their, their share price went off the scale. In fact, they, they're, they're more valuable as a company now than the gross domestic product of Denmark, where they're actually based. So it gives you an idea of the, the quantum of what's been possible with this. And bear in mind that people are just looking at it for weight loss at the moment. The interesting thing, of course, is it's demonstrated that it's, it's also cardioprotective, because if people have got less weight on their bodies, there's less pressure on their hearts. But likewise, now they're being, uh, I know that scientists are now looking at this particular drug as a longevity drug, and in, and in my studies, it's also proven that it is neuroprotective, so it means that potentially it's a, it's a preventative for, for Alzheimer's. So effectively, it's got three of those big diseases of aging within, within one um, therapy, and this is, as you can see, making a, a, a big inroad into their, into their share price, but it's moving the concepts of what's happening in the way that people are starting to, to think in terms of preventative. So you can see these are some of the headlines that were on the FT at the time. Uh, if you can imagine over the next few years what this looks like when people are starting to talk about longevity. It's not there yet. There are lots of therapeutics in the pipeline. They're at phase two, which is about TRL6 of that chart I showed you earlier. It's going to take time for them to come through, but we can see that really these, these biotech companies that are moving towards these longevity therapies are actually going to be very, very, very valuable companies. So. Uh, I think I've done Nova Nordisk to death there. So, so there's my, my QR code. So please feel free just to, to take an image of that. If you want my slides, I'll send them over to you. I'm going to show it again, show it again at the end. And this, the theme for this, this talk was also about investment. So I've got some investment slides to, to share with you, or whether this is going to be of great interest to you or not, I don't know. But we're, we're an industry analyst group, so we run longevity.technology, which is a daily news service. Uh, for the industry, but we also have a, uh, a large area of uh, consumer education content. And um, sitting behind all of that is the data that we've now got as a company. So we've tracked 870 plus companies within the longevity economy. They sit across all of those different 25 domains that I showed you earlier. And what we do when we put out our quarterly reports or our annual reports, we're actually demonstrating what's happening with, uh, with the actual growth of the industry. So you can see there's been a very nice uh, steady growth of the industry to 2021 being that breakout year. A tough year in 2022, which, which was basically supported by an investment uh, by, purportedly by Jeff Bezos into a company called Altos Labs, which was at three billion. So that obviously helped to sustain uh, that particular market. But we're now in 2023, which is a very tough year. I don't know what is experience, the experiences in the psychedelics industry, but in the, in the biotech and longevity industry, it has been pretty brutal. Um, you can see that this is where the money's coming from. So a lot of it is early stage VC. No surprise there because obviously companies are in their early stages and therefore they need that high risk capital. But of course there are publicly, quant publicly quoted companies as well, which we would consider really a very exciting uh, 
a demonstration of what people's appetite for, for longevity is, is in, the, in the public markets. These are the top domains. As you can see, longevity discovery platforms, that was that large spike at the end. But you can see here there's some other very interesting ones. These are all about rejuvenating at a cellular level uh, the human body. And there's some very interesting and breakthrough science happening in that space yet. Still a long way from being in humans, but moving towards that. And one of the things that we're now doing as an industry analyst group is to identify the progression that each of these companies are making across those, those uh, 10 TRL levels. So we get an idea of when eventually somebody's going to say, OK, it's going to be approved. When will we start to see these therapies? So we're gonna, we expect that to be within five years. So this is in the long grasp of the detail here, but you can see in the quarter by quarter, there's been a steady growth uh, of investment capital coming back into the space. Uh, in terms then of the deal sizes, you can see that the deal sizes are going up to around 20 million. So these companies are still in the early stages. 20 million doesn't last a long time as a, as a, as a biotech industry business. And no surprise, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the, the size of the US biotech industry, but the US is really the, uh, the real driver for, for growth geographically in this sector, and, and California itself is, uh, is a big part of that as well. So um, interestingly, we, we represent a lot of investors that are looking at the space. Um, a lot of people are now understanding when, when is the right time to get into longevity. So a lot of people are putting money into those longevity now categories, whether it's supplements or clinics. Uh, but likewise, there's, there's a need for that capital also to go into biotech. And we're, we're very excited about some of the science as well as the investment capital going into that space. So a very quick word about us. So longevity technology, as I mentioned, we have business news, uh, we have investment an analysis, we are also an investment broker uh, operating under SEC in the US. We, we do a lot of consumer work, and we're also actually just about to launch our own consumer app so we can help people identify their own um, biological age and understand whether it's higher or lower. In the case of my wife, you can see it was, it was higher. I'm sure that's going to change. So people have got something to start working with. So our, our members and our readers will basically be a beneficiary of our own, of our own tech platform. The great news is, is that we're now being referred to by other mainstream publications, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. So very excited about that because they're really starting to take on the, the seriousness of this industry. They're not looking at this industry as something that's wacko. They're taking it very, very seriously. And, and uh, I'm very grateful that our data is being used out there. We hit 1.25 million uh, unique users in July. Uh, of this year, which was a, was a very big month for us. We haven't repeated it just yet, but you can get an idea of our growth, and therefore our growth is representative of growth and interest in the sector, and we've already punched through our 5 million unique users uh, during the course of this year. So just to finish off, and um, Healthy Longevity Clinic, I've got a stand here, and um, uh, interestingly, when you look at the, uh, the disease state, you can see that little circle there. Well, I, had my, I went to a longevity clinic, I went through all sorts of tests in the clinic. And interestingly, this is a VO2 max that I, that I went through. Now, I like to consider myself healthy. I used to do a lot of big swims and a lot of big cycle rides. But you can see here that the red line is off the black trajectory. And likewise, the blue line is off the black trajectory. So I actually found out uh, earlier this year that I had early onset cardiovascular disease. So all, the, all of the small uh, capillaries in my body were starting to, to fill up with plaque. Now, luckily, that's reversible. So it's reversible through exercise and reversible actually through supplementation and, and, and taking statins. But you can see there, that's a prime example of my, my benefit of having early detection of what's going on within my body, which is something that obviously we, we all deserve and we all should have access to. So I recommend checking out their, uh, their booth. They're, uh, they're a great company. So I'm only one minute off the end of my presentation, so I think that's it. There's my QR if, if you need it. And thanks very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Great. OK. I'm going to go. Hey. Sean, thank thank you. you so much. Phil Newman, everybody. Right. Thanks.